Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming along. Uh, my name is Louise Say, and it's a real privilege uh, to be here today chairing this session sponsored by Directors UK and entitled Standing Out from the Crowd, the Director's Voice in Factual TV. Um, just to let you know the order of play, uh, we're just going, I'm just going to introduce the speakers and then we're going to individually introduce our thoughts on, on the theme of this session. Uh, then the, there'll be a heated debate uh, between the four of us. And uh, right. hopefully. <laughs> not, with my hang not with my hangover, though, I think. <laughs> Although Bruce is a bit hungover, you say. Sorry. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, and then uh, we'll be taking questions at the end, and there'll be plenty of time for questions, so um, please feel free to pitch in at that point. So, it's a real pleasure, pleasure today to introduce our three speakers uh, Bruce Goodison. Bruce is one of Britain's most highly regarded award winning directors. He works across both documentary and drama broadening storytelling possibilities of difficult and morally complex subjects such as war, asylum and crime. And among many others, uh, he has won Grierson, RTS and BAFTA for Our War and Our World War, and his recent film, Murdered by My Father, won an RTS and a BAFTA. Amanda Richardson. Amanda is an award-winning shooting PD with over 20 years' experience in broadcast television with credits including Modern Times, Quality Time, once a Soldier, and U.S. Babies Behind Bars. Documentary feature Carrie Greenham Home has a cult following and recently has one of the shooting PDs on BBC's Hospital series. She won Grierson, RTS, and Amnesty Awards for BBC Productions. Dan Reed. Dan has directed documentaries for BBC, Channel 4, and HBO, winning a number of awards for his work, including five BAFTAs. His films, whether observed or retold, combine exhaustive research and investigation with intimate, character-led storytelling and a cinematic approach to sound and picture. So that's the introductions over with. I just thought I'd kick start with a few big thoughts and a clip uh, before I pass over to Bruce and then Amanda and Dan. Now, I just thought that a session about directors would not be complete without a quote from Alfred Hitchcock. Um, and he said, in feature films, the director is God, in documentary, God is the director. <laughs> but in the current factual climate where formatted shows crowd the schedule, just how creative can we be? Is the documentary God still the director or is it the format? Are we just ticking format boxes as we shoot? Do we need to raise our voices to be heard? And if we do so, will we be listened to? Now I think as directors, a lot of us want to stand out from the crowd. It's part of our DNA uh, to have a creative vision that is manifested in the films that we produce. Now, I've experienced both sides of the fence as a director and more recently as a series producer. And I want to show you a clip from a series that I was most recently involved in. It was called uh, Prison, First and Last 24 Hours. It's an STV production for Sky One. Uh, there were a team of pretty much 30, 35 people involved, so it was a very collaborative effort. And at the heart of it, there were four producer directors uh, in four prisons, filming both for format and consistency, and brought their own creative experience and flair to the series. I'll show you that clip now. Thank you. As I say, a huge collaborative effort with uh, four producer directors there um, at the heart of it. Okay, over to you, Bruce. Morning. Um, uh, I, I feel like the slightly, uh, the slightly more fraudulent uh, member of this panel because um, I've, I, I haven't really made a documentary for quite some time. And I think the, the last time I made a documentary was um, uh, Our War. Um, and that was, I suppose, loosely formatted in a way. Um, although, I mean, I think my interests probably lie in um, uh, constructing um, realities or uh, and making dramas about uh, particularly you know uh, tricky subjects as was pointed out with my murder and murder by my father um, but with our war there was a sort of um, there is always I think there's always a challenge when you're trying to sort of um, make something about something new about um, what might be considered to be a well-trodden subject I think that's one of the kind of things about trying to sort of stand out and I guess with that, we had a kind of cachet, if you like, of um, Dan was also involved in the series, 
um, we had a cache of materials which we tried to, you know, a massive kind of hard drive of self-shot um, soldiers' material to weave a story from. So there's a kind of, if you like, a reverse engineering of looking at that footage and then finding the people in that footage and then interviewing them. Um, and we did decide on the kind of, you know, the uh, Interatron approach to it. And, uh, and the reason for that was that, you know, well, certainly for me, um, uh, I wanted to try and get inside the heads of the soldiers. It wasn't so much about what they said, because most soldiers maybe aren't the most eloquent of speakers, but it was about how they said it. And so um, that became the sort of one of the sort of benchmarks of the series. Um, and, you know, we shot it. Uh, we needed to shoot quite a lot of characters, so it was shot, I think, on the, on the 5D when I did it on the first program. Um, and um, a lot of the time, we're trying to create the right environment. We talked a bit about this yesterday, create the right environment for the people that we put in front of a camera. And, and I think that, I think, for all of us, we probably share that same experience of trying to make people, I mean, we talk about the comfort level of people, but I think it's about make, uh, making sure we create a space where people are able to be their best um, and their most trust, uh, because they're putting their trust in you. So you've got to be able to create an environment which really, really helps with that. Um, and part of that was showing them and bringing them back to a particular place in, the, in a very traumatic history, which was showing them clips of um, probably the most traumatic day of their life when you know, one of their mates was shot in front of them, etc. So that in itself was a construction. Um, and, um, and then I, I, I suppose I moved into feeling quite difficult about the duty of care I would have towards all of those soldiers. And certainly I struggle with the kind of, if you like, the, the, the difficulty of working with people and, and, and making them share things that are very, very difficult for them to share. And then having that duty of care going forward through the broadcast, broadcast of a program. So I, I started to use a lot more um, document, uh, drama techniques and drama. So, um, uh, and, and it almost is a kind of cloak of comfort for a lot of people. So I made a film called Leave to Remain, for instance, which was about uh, young asylum seekers um, coming to the UK, which started life as a documentary. But then realizing that putting them in front of the camera could further endanger their lives uh, if they were trafficked, but it also might jeopardize their asylum um, application. So drama was used as a way of protecting that um, uh, those sensitivities. Um, and uh, the clip I'm going to show you is, um, um, is a point, I guess, of, uh, of a career transition in a way, where um, it was a, a film, a film called Flight 93. I used to make quite a lot of kind of um, hybrid films, drama documentaries, and um, uh, this one was unusual in how it challenged the broadcaster, um, uh, because it, there is a construction there, um, but it's um, it's not a, it's not a sort of factual construction. So um, uh, and it was quite hard. I think probably all of us probably find it quite hard to find clips that we were kind of given a strict limit of like ninety, 90 seconds, seconds or two, <laughs> two minutes. And it's like you're looking at your whole kind of life's work and go, how do I? What do I? What am I going to talk about? So anyway, without further ado, let's show the clip. <laughs> so a very chilled clip for uh, <laughs> midday on the. <laughs> whatever, whatever it is. Um, uh, it, it was what I was trying to reach, I guess, with that was a sort of uh, a transcendental quality. And if you speak to a commissioning editor or a, uh, an exec producer and use the word transcendental, it's like getting P45. So uh, uh, I, I, fought, I fought for that. And, um, and you know, it, it's a kind of mix up of people's grief. I reconstructed with the local police the entire visit that they did. And you know, we use the word cathartic for a lot of people that we work with, but um, for both the police that had um, had this plane crash and the seismic event in their back backyard, they wanted to find another opportunity to uh, meet those families and go to that place and mourn with them. But it was a way, again, of trying to, I think all the time, we as filmmakers try and find a way of standing out by 
bringing you, the audience, way you know, much, much closer to the experience of the people that we film. And you know, I try and use those kinds of techniques to do that. Thank you, Bruce. Amanda. Um, yes, well, I, I, I come to this from, um, um, really, it's a period of watching how documentaries have changed and the elements we put into documentaries. And so perhaps we're, that's where there's a link. We're all making documentaries which are, are telling people's stories and uh, intimate stories in the main, sensitive documentaries. But, um, but we're all using different elements in how we do that. So I suppose uh, I, I always started working in a very small team, um, in a small team with three, and I've ended up most recently working in a very collaborative team, in a huge team, um, um, on hospital. So uh, what I thought in terms of choosing a, a clip was to, to choose something where I worked in a small team, where it was me shooting as a director, working with an AP sound recordist. Um, and I came to that through... Um, my training. I went to the National Film School where uh, it was the National Film School then you actually shot on film. Um, so my graduation film was shot on an Arton. So it's quite a, um, a relatively small but shoulder mounted camera on 16 mil where you had just a 10 minute magazine, which meant that you were very simplistic about what you shot and how you shot it. Um, but so that was my starting point. Um, and then I moved into television and um, we moved from film, then we moved to tape and then we moved to much smaller, easier cameras, more lightweight, um, and not needing to change lenses as much. You'd stick on one zoom, and that's how you'd shoot your documentary. Um, so the clip that I've, I've chosen, I mean, it was 90 seconds, and you just think, well, what, what, what could you possibly choose? So I chose, um, this, was, um, this was a documentary that was uh, commissioned by Discovery. It was reversioned, and um, it went out on ITV1. And, and, and now it's on, it's on Netflix. Um, and it's shot in the States, it's Indiana Women's Prison, where if you, if you go into prison and you're pregnant and you've got less than two years to serve, you have got the option of giving birth to your baby in a local hospital, chained to the bed, needless to say. Um, but then you have the, op the, the option, if you can, of taking your newborn baby back to you to your cell and raising that child till you leave. Um, so the clip I've chosen is, um, is Heather. Um, and I should say, I suppose, that most of the documentaries that I've ever been involved in, generally I'm interested in institutions and places, prisons, hospitals, um, the Royal Hospital Chelsea. I'm, I'm really interested seeing people within a, within a confine. Um, Heather was a very difficult um, uh, contributor to sort of scratch away and get at. Um, she was in for theft and prostitution. And... Um, um, Yes, well, perhaps we should just look at the clip and yeah. see what you think. Let's show the clip. No, so that, that, um, that documentary, we turned up at the prison and no one had actually wrecked the prison. So in terms of, if you think now how you work, the, all the efforts that we, we go into in casting, all the interatron um, that's often, often used after the event, um, um, fixed rig, um, so we feel that we're covering everything from all angles, um, and drones, of course. Um, so the, this was shot at a time when those weren't, those weren't part of the vocabulary that we were using. Um, and as I say, we were a team of, of two. Um, um, then, I came, then I came to hospital. In fact, I took five years out because I was approached to do um, a commercial, some commercial work for oil and gas, so I came out of television and I came out for five years, and so I felt I really needed to get back to documentaries because I, uh, in the space of five years, so much seems to have changed. Um, hospital had been commissioned um, for, by, with Label One, uh, um, uh, Danny, Danny Horan's uh, commission, um, and it was a very unusual commission in that it was going to be a fast turnaround, it was going to be six one hours, um, and the plan was to have a very large team over a short space of time. Um, uh, and, and I loved it. I mean, I don't know if any of you saw the earlier session, you saw some clips of the new series. I worked on the first series, and the second series is starting next week. It was a massive team in the sense that rather than there being two people on the crew, here we had three exec producers, two series producers. Um, I was one of six shooting, shooting PDs. Then there was another team around that, uh, edit producers, and I think 11 editors. Um, 
but fundamentally, the, um, I mean, it was an unprecedented, a real groundbreaking approach to do such a fast turnaround. But fundamentally, the directing element was the same. Um, a, a huge contrast to the way that I worked before, where you're a team of two and you might spend 12 or 18 months in a hospital setup or a prison, and then you go into an edit again for another long period of time. This was turned on its head, a sort of inverted sort of pyramid of, um, of this huge team that was in the hospital. Um, but as I said, the same principles, access was fundamental, the relationships, we had all these other issues of consent and confidentiality. Um, but uh, Simon Dixon and Lorraine Chuck Phillips were really, really clear with all of us as shooting PDs that they wanted us not to, not to stand back and just and observe, to be very interactive, um, to talk to staff, to talk to patients, and to get this real, the, the relationships going. And so it's all credit to them that it was almost a fixed rig fixed rig coverage in the sense that we were all over the hospital and all over so many sites in a short period of time. Um, in a way, a sort of fixed rig that was moving. We were quizzing staff all the time as we went. And um, there was no opportunity to then do interviews afterwards, no interatron. Everything had to be shot on the fly and shot on the moment. So it was, um, well, it was what it was. Uh, exceptional, exciting, really interesting television. Um, and... Um, I suppose in terms of the director's distinctive voice that we're talking about, um, as directors, we all had different approaches. I mean, I, I like working handheld. I might use a monopod. Um, running down a corridor with a monopod, getting caught between your legs, I sort of, got, I sort of abandoned that a bit after time and went for a saddle. But um, lots of people on the team chose to go for an easy rig. But fundamentally, as directors, we were all making decisions about who we shot, how we shot, what lens we used, um, whether we stayed on a Zoom, whether we were swapping around and using primes. I think that was probably an issue yeah. with yours about the, the look, um, the tone that we were all trying to, to match, but bringing to, bringing to it our own sort of sensibilities. Um, and um, I guess the hardest job was, um, was for them in the edit because you'd be following your stories and you'd feel very wedded to a story, a patient's story, but you've got no guarantee that that's going to be used in that final edit or that it's going to be followed or picked up in the same way by another director. So I think I probably spent half my time shooting and keeping those relationships going because those are fundamental to any documentary, but also just keeping the access going, speaking to consultants and, and, and really, I suppose, laying the foundations for another team that might be coming in tonight because it was pretty much a 24-hour operation rolling, which is why there were two producers and three exec producers, so we could all work like that. Um, and um, I suppose the, the key to the series and why it's been so good is it actually hasn't, it's got all that intimacy. Um, we have got used to seeing a lot of fixed rig, a lot of interatron, and so you do feel you're getting that, that sort of uh, interaction with the contributor. I suppose that I was trying to speak to Heather, you know, in the prison, there was nowhere to take her for an interview that was quiet. Um, and you were always up against a wall. The rooms were so small and you were locked in. So, I mean, we all have constraints we work, we work around. The hospital was always noisy. You could never find a quiet moment. So I think that the, that the way that hospital has worked so well is that intimacy. Um, and that's what I feel that I, I bring when I make documentaries. That's great. I think we'll come back to that in the discussion that we have after. Dan, moving on to you, if you'd like to introduce your thoughts on the theme. And your clip. Um, you know, how do you how do you how do you stand out today as a as a up and coming director? Um, I have a small production company, and we're I'm looking for I look for new directors, and I'm thinking, what do I look for, and what makes a director stand out for me? I think now nowadays, as opposed to it's very different from when I started, but um, nowadays shooting and the, how, you, how you operate a camera and how familiar you are with the editing process um, and the, and the uh, software, even though those, are sort of, those can be as, seen as sort of technical departments, I think they're fundamental because many directors cut their teeth or find employment in these big series like 24 Hours and Hospital and, and, and for, for directors who are just starting, it means that they, they get to meet contributors and they get the whole sort of production side of things, but then often they say goodbye to their rushes, which are sort of 
you know, taken into a, a kind of centralized editing process, and then the edit producers, et cetera, involved. So the director doesn't have end-to-end -end, uh, involvement. And I think that's fundamentally, it's a very difficult thing to, it's a difficult setting in which to learn the skills of directing, because ultimately everything you do as a director, every single decision you make is about what you're going to end up with in the edit and how you're going to use your material in the edit. So you have to, if you like, think, of course, you think of everything from that perspective. You think uh, every step you take and every frame you shoot is, contains an intention and that intention is, is I want this in the edit or I want that in the edit. And if you don't have any input into the edit, then, sorry, then, um, then, then it's very hard to, to sort of to develop as a director, as a storyteller, because you don't have any control over the whole, how the story is going to be put together. So that's why I look for directors who have maybe worked outside sort of industrial television um, and have been able to really control the whole story they're telling, whether it's a short or, or something they've put together off their own back or, or you know, um, I don't know, a promo for Greenpeace or whatever it might be, but directors who've sort of been able to do the whole thing themselves from shoot to edit. So I think that sort of is a, is a great um, is a, is a great selling point for me when I'm looking for a new director. So I think it's really really important, more important than ever, for directors to master camera operating skills, really good in depth camera operating skills, and also to be able to edit their own material because um, otherwise you may never get the chance to to actually edit a whole film of yours for sort of five or ten years while you're busy you're trying to earn a living and, and working on these big series which which take away the opportunity to, to uh, get involved in the edit. The clip I'm going to show is from, uh, I, I basically had to, when I set up my company in 2013, I had to learn to, to shoot. I hadn't really shot very much before at all. And I spent a long time like nerding out in the camera gear and lenses and stuff like that, which has stood me in good stead because I know the equipment back to front and I can then advise directors, younger directors who come to work for me. But um, the clip I want to show is the pre-title sequence from The Pedophile Hunter, which is a documentary I made for, for Channel 4. <coughs> Excuse me, and I think what you see is that is is a combination of things. It's um, we achieved a really strong relationship with the main contributor, the Peter Von Hunter himself, Stinson Hunter. So you see, we're very close to him. He's very relaxed in our in our presence. I'm operating the camera. The the the, the tripod is right down on the floor. It's very close to him, and it means that I can I can drag the focus across his. Skin, you know, got a very shallow plane of focus. I'm shooting wide open on prime on a prime lens, and you can see there's a kind of sensual kind of, I suppose, intimacy with him, and you know that's something I guess you can only achieve if you spent a long, you know, all those sort of classic documentary skills that a lot of people develop and we look for in a good documentary PD, which is the ability to form close relationships and get the subject comfortable and get the camera close. And in this case, we managed to get the camera very close indeed at, at a time. I mean, I didn't, when I shot this, I didn't really know it was going to be the pre-title sequence. I was just like, it was another day and he was just doing his thing and we were just shooting. And, you know, um, it turned into something um, a bit special. So. So I think, you know, to stand out, you need to, the first thing you need to do is, is, is try and imagine how your material is going to be used in the edit and try and shoot different types of material. Shoot, you know, the, the dialogue. You remember, you have all these, the great thing about getting involved in the edit is you, you realize you can, you can use all these elements, dialogue and picture and music and, and all of this. You can use them separately and you can use them together and you can, you know, you can really basically, um, you know, it's a rich you should have a rich collection of material and, and, and I think the first thing is make sure that you don't end up in the edit with all the same type of material, with all the same type of perspective, you know, try things out and try and really, you know, um, in, in, you know, editing is a, uh, sorry, directing is, is, a, is a team endeavor and you, you know, you need to work with your editor, hopefully from before, while you're even shoot, while you're shooting, you need to get to know your editor. I'd encourage um, new directors to get involved with an editor, to make friends with editors, because ultimately they're the people who are going to be co-creating the work. Also, relationships with execs. I mean, along a, a, a couple of directors that I'm are working for me now, I've kind of had an ongoing dialogue with for even for a couple of years. Um, one of them, Tom Percy, who's doing the first cut for me at the moment, he was the second camera on, on Peter Farnter. And, and so you, you develop a relationship of trust. And, and, and it's, it's, so for a director, bless you, for a director, it's about 
you know, it's about the relationships, the key relationships with your exec, with your editor. Um, start developing those to also give you the room to, to do the things that make you stand out, to reduce the anxiety levels at the broadcaster. So that it's all about trust and creating a space in which you can then take advice from the editor, take advice from the exec, and create the material that you need in, in the edit that is going to be diverse and different and give yourself, you know, it's a, directing drama taught me an awful lot about, about the kind of material you want at the end in the, in the cutting room and how to organize it. Um, and, you know, I think that's a key thing. If I were a director now, I'd learn to operate camera really, really well. Um, and, and also just play, you know, get, get a, an Avid or a Final Cut Pro or something and just, and just start playing around with, with, with my rushes and, um, and try and produce something that will then impress an exec who will fall in love and, um, and decide to, you know, stake their reputation on giving you a chance. That's terrific. I think one of the common themes amongst all of us is that whether you're working in a large team of self shooters like on hospital mm -hmm. or on a, a one-off, there seems to be a, a drive, that intimacy, that trust with contributors is, is such an important factor and that's before you've even picked a camera up. I know on the prison series, my teams, my producers, directors with the APs went into prison and they were in there four weeks before they even showed a camera and it's developing that trust and intimacy. But I'm curious to know, uh, you know, to what extent, um, if you're producing and directing a one-off or a programme within a series, ha what, the, what are the differences of that against being one of many cell shooters on a series? Just wondering what, what you might think about that. Um, my experience of being part of a the sort of team you've described um, is, is limited. So... Um, a small one or the large... A group? A crew of two, or crew well, no, as in a, a, a large group of directors oh. on a series. Mm. Um, uh, so, with um, I mean, you know, again, talking about our war, there were um, three PDs and a um, and an exec, and a very, you know, it was a very, very um, tight and supportive team. We would often uh, talk very, very closely about how we were going to um, uh, shoot the series and um, on, on what it was that we were going to try and do that was somehow fresh. Um, and we did shoot tests, for instance, I think it's very important. And I, I agree that, you know, uh, having control over uh, how you shoot and, how, you know, or how shooting is done and how editing is done is, is also crucial. And also within that, I even had conversations with my team about the use of music, which as you can see, I, I, I tend to use a lot of music. So, and, and I think that is one thing that does allow you to, if you like, you know, stand out, because there is a morass of, uh, of quite bland music that gets used in TV, sometimes for, you know, clearance reasons, etc. but there are an enormous amount of, uh, of composers out there that are just dying to try and do something a little bit more different, a little bit, you know, and it, and it does draw you into material in a way that uh, sometimes just going, you know, interview sequence, etc. I mean, obviously, you know, with Dan's clip, who was... I think it looked like you were using a little bit of uh, voice out of um, out of picture, etc. And it's just using that. I mean, with 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 ours, there was uh, a need because of the amount of green that was on <laughs> on camera because you're with soldiers and it's and it's helmet shot footage, so it's always going to be of a certain width. So therefore, it was trying to create the palette that 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 Dan talked about in terms of you know the size of shots, close-ups, wides. We didn't have that. So, but we also needed to also bring in a level of where are they now? So there were, there were points, so, so as a, for instance, with the first episode, I discovered a letter, a letter that hadn't been sent to, or had been sent uh, and sent back to uh, a bereaved mom. And so I could see there was an active narrative and wanted to mm. um, explore that question. And so therefore, we as a team, did try and identify what could we find within our specific programs with our specific stories that gave us some sort of present day narrative, um, obviously the reflective narrative, mm. um, and how to uh, manage the self shot material so that it didn't feel like a kind of, you know, blancmange of camouflage, mm. you know. Um, so for me, it was a, a very, very um, uh, meaningful and supportive process. It wasn't as if, as the lead director, I was saying, okay, this is how it's gonna be, guys. It was sort of like, mm -hmm. and then you also have to present the thing you want to do to a, 
exec or a commissioning editor. Mm. And at that point, you, they're kind of like, I don't get it, I don't understand. And I think probably in my, in my younger days, I might get, what do you mean you don't get it? It's gonna be great, just trust me, it's gonna be great. That trust you kind of have to earn and explain. I mean, I still try and do, go on, just trust me, it's gonna be great. But ultimately, you know, you try and negotiate your way with those people that are a little bit, because, you know, commissioning editors are still humans and they do get scared about new ideas. Uh, and, you know, but ultimately we should be in a, we should be in an environment where using things like rigs, etc., cetera, um, you know, it helps us explore uh, the human psyche and it's just finding ways of managing the expectations of the broadcaster so they get whatever dramatic and emotional and commercial hit that they want from what it is you're creating. So there is a, not only a management of your team and your material, but also a management of those people around you to make sure everybody is working harmoniously for the same purpose. Otherwise, it becomes a right old mess. Absolutely, but, we but don't want to write all mess. Amanda, did you ever feel that your no. um, creativity was stifled or do you think that you were encouraged as one of many on hospital? Well, I, w I was just going to say that it's relationships with the people that we're filming, but you're mm -hmm. right, it's relationships with commissioners and execs. Mm -hmm. If you're working in a team of two, then that relationship is a much easier one to manage. And I think that I, I hear and see a lot of people having terrible times because of the input of the sort of team above them. I think that something like, like you know, that, that, that film in that, in that prison, I can remember the American exec saying, right, I want you to shoot stuff of all the women that you're casting so I can make a decision. And I thought, look, I've just landed here. I, 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 I haven't got the headspace really all the time to start casting on camera and shooting people and then having a sort of cards, card shuffle. So, so you can direct very straightforwardly with that person and say, look, I'm willing to do it, but I can't shoot it and upload it, download it, edit it, um, edit it, because that's what I would be supposed to be doing. But we'd, sh we'd shoot stills and we'd do that. Also, so that, also that, I mean, that there's a potential of alienating those people that you're casting. Yeah, well, exactly. It's all, all of that. They're not actors. So it, it's, it's trying to negotiate with your contributors and with the team that you're working with. On hospital, I think it was different again because um, you're stumbling across individuals and you're casting people that you're wanting to work with. But there wasn't a casting, there was permissions, a whole load of permissions. Um, there'd be other people here who worked on hospital, but the, the consent, consent from all the staff, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a blanket um, yes from everybody. So there was a certain amount of casting, but in the main it was getting permissions as we trawled along. But what was different about hospital was that there was, um, there's a, in the edit, a whole team dealing with the stories and the drama and story producers. So as Lorraine was talking about at an earlier session, I might be investing all my time following a story with a contributor and wanting them to be part of that, that part of the series or part of that episode. Um, but a story producer, in terms of the drama, it's, it's not ticking the boxes. Or this feeling that somehow you should be producing a story which I, I, I'm not used to and don't really like to do. But there is this feeling of expectation, um, high drama, high production values. So a pressure that you, you feel much more, I think, in making documentaries that we didn't have 10 or 15 years ago. In a nutshell, how were you creative on hospital? Or did you feel at times, right, I've got this, this, this to shoot today. In, in what sense was it box ticking? In what sense were you being creative within ticking those boxes? I think it's about where you chose to stop. The, the member of staff that you're working, if you're shooting on, shooting on the fly, it's where you chose to do that interview or what lens you chose to shoot it on, where you chose to stop and talk to them. Because ultimately you're making that choice and then in the edit they've, got, they've only got what you're delivering up to them. And I think a lot of people felt sometimes there was a wish list of things to do. Get the arrival, get them leaving, get the appointment. And I, f I could feel a pressure from some people feeling, I haven't, I missed them arriving. Oh, perhaps we could. Mm -hmm. And you'd think, well, what they haven't got in the edit, they won't miss. And what you've got to concentrate always is on your contributors, the intimacy, the access, keep moving forward. Um, and seeing, seeing the roots and also how you pass on that story then to another member of the team. Absolutely. I, one of the common themes that's brought up a lot, certainly with shooting PDs on prison series, that they didn't have the opportunity to go into the edit. 
because the schedules were so tight. I was wondering, Dan, you, you touched a lot on, you know, edit your own material, yet often there's not the opportunity uh, to do that because obviously you're shooting against delivery. Mm. Mm. I think even if you're shooting for a kind of centralised edit machine, you can still ask yourself, what material does the editor need to cut this scene in a very basic way? So what's the transition into the scene? What's the transition out of the scene? Where does the scene begin and end? Where do we get in? Where do we get out? What's the first shot? What's the key dialogue? What's driving the story in the scene? What are the reactions? What's the setting? You know, there, 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 there's kind of a, which you learn when you're drama directing, uh, as Bruce knows, you know, you, you, you have to have... There's a wish list that you have to Yeah, have. there's a certain collection of shots which allow a scene to be cut. Mm -hmm. If you don't have all those shots, then the editor has his or her hands tied. Mm -hmm. And so if you're giving the editor that range of material, they're going to notice you and they're going to go, wow, you know, so-and-so is doing a really good job. He's given me lots of options. I can tell this story as fast or as slow as I want. Sorry. No, I just, the only thing I was just going to add to that, that, that collection of material and the tick boxing, and I know it sounds like kind of a very me mechanistic um, uh, part of creativity, but I think that um, there is this overall tone and mood that should have been pre-decided mm. of what it is you're going to be going for. <coughs> well, there is. We knew that from a taste yeah. to take. Yeah. So, you know, there's a certain way mm. someone can walk into a building mm. and there's a certain, you know, you, oh, can, yeah, you can just shoot the souls falling mm. on the pavement or you can shoot mm. a slow-mo or it can mm. be nice. Or it can be, you know, there's a range mm. of mm. decisions you can make mm. according to the what the tone yeah. of, the, of, the sh of the show is, if you like. So I, mm. I do think that even if you're not editing your material, mm. there should be you know, a, an awareness of what material is required for that edit, both in wide shots, close-ups, you know, and also obviously the key thing, which is the contributor's uh, contribution, whether that be, you know, within actuality or within an interview scenario. Absolutely. One thing I want to pick up on, you said, uh, Bruce, just after you showed your clip, that you had to fight for a shot. Yeah. Let's talk about the fighting that goes on. <laughs> Um, I'm quite curious to know, because often I think as uh, producer directors, you are far removed from commissioning editors these days. You may not even be in the edit uh, where your rushes are being discussed because an edit producer is there instead. But let's talk about the fight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do tend to have a fair amount of those people who may, may be in the room who may have worked with me, I think that's a couple. Uh, I do tend to have those quite sort of, you know, active discussions um, <laughs> are, are, are about... <laughs> about, uh, you know, largely about tone and how to tell a story because I do, I do like to try and push, if you like, the creative envelope of what it is I'm trying to achieve. Um, so, you know, uh, looking at something like, um, I mean, with documentary, we tend, sometimes we can push into the world of slightly punishing uh, our viewers, depending on the subject matter. And I think we have to kind of allow ourselves to be pulled back, certainly by some execs and producers. And I would say that probably we can go a little bit rogue, depending on the subject matter. So for instance, with um, uh, uh, our, our, our war, um, there was a level of gore. And, um, and it's about that balance you try and strike between wanting to really, really expose your audience to um, extraordinarily dark and dangerous and you know, dramatic situations. But then sometimes you can just push people into a place of like, you know what, I can't watch that. So there, you do, I mean, one does sometimes need to be pulled back from those sorts of positions. Um, and, you know, I uh, had a strange conversation this, this morning with a, uh, a commission editor about um, a series I made called Born to Kill, where he said, I couldn't watch it after, after episode two. It was just too dark. I just thought, actually, that really, <laughs> I just like, well, what was the point of me making it if people aren't going to watch it? <laughs> so um, so uh, um, it, it's, there is, you do have to align yourselves in a way with people that um, can understand what you're trying to achieve and at the same time maybe guide you when you sometimes go a little bit rogue. Mm. But the director, of course, is supposed to have this be the leading creative voice on a programme. How but, often does that happen anymore? Is it something that is just in the schedule every now and again? Most, most, most formatted programmes tend to have, you know, like we've experienced a, a large group of collaborating PDs, mm. edit producers. I, I think Dan's absolutely right about actually starting to, you know, shoot your own stuff and put it together because 
quite frankly, there is, we are heading into a, a, a really weird territory of, I mean, in the BBC years ago, APs were starting to shoot. And there were a lot of APs and researchers who were really good at what they did. And they felt that they actually, if they didn't start shooting, somehow they wouldn't be seen as as, as, as good as they could be. Mm. And there were a lot of people who, were, who weren't technically minded, who really didn't need to have done that. But there is this move now that it feels that you just have to be shooting. And interestingly enough, there's not much... There's not much priority put on sound. And quite frankly, I think the sound is so important. And certainly on hospital, I said to any of the researchers or APs that I, w I was working with, with wireless booms, look, you know, because we hadn't worked together an awful lot, is just get that boom right in where you need to get good sound. And I will either reframe or I'll, I'll ask you to pop, to pop out. But this, basically, if the sound's not right, then the material won't get used. So it's interesting that it's all moving towards the look as opposed to some, getting some really good documentary sound recordists. Um, and I think the other thing was, I, thought I, I felt a bit of the oddball in the team, because I was always there late. I didn't, I didn't tend to shoot my couple of cars and then just chuck them in for the data wrangler. I had this real sort of OCD thing, because I've do, you know, been doing that before on my own things, of doing a rough log. And it was a fast log, it was just done, I wasn't stopping and starting, but so I actually knew what was on that card, what I'd shot, because if you're just handing this stuff over, you sort of don't remember what you got. Were you in record, weren't you in record? And so there's something about ownership of the material that you've mm. shot and understanding, actually, you know, when, um, when you see the finished film, you know, when sometimes you watch things that you shot yourself, you might watch a, a trailer on television and think, well, that's something I shot, but a trailer can be cut in such a way, you think, wow, it, it's, it's very different to the way that I shot it. Um, it's a bit like you're talking about your opening title. Mm, um, mm. So I think you're absolutely right. You know, people starting out need to start putting their stuff together mm. and illustrating what it is they can do, whether that's sound, picture, directing. I think a, a, a strange thing, I mean, the, the way the industry's evolved is, is we've both got the sort of a centralization of the creative control in, with the editors, with the execs, so that rushes are basically gathered by a team and then sent into into a sort of dark hole. Where you the, feel where like the they're progress. out in the road yeah. doing the digging. Yeah. I'm in the yeah. I'm in the road doing exactly. the digging. But what's um, happened? What I mean, that's partly as a result of the way television's evolved, but also as a way of the way technology's evolved with mm. smaller, more portable cameras, etc. But the the same technical evolution has made it possible for directors starting out to have complete control mm. over, over, over a piece, but to do it much more cheaply or to do it on the fringes of broadcast. Mm. And, and so those two things have happened. So I'm seeing quite a few directors who come to me and are complete sort of one woman or one woman, one woman or one man bands and, and can do everything from start to finish mm. and are often very, very single-minded and, and, and can benefit from being sort of brought into a more television way of doing things and, and, and it's teamed up hard, with someone. isn't it? It is hard. I mean, I think increasingly the field, you know, standing out, being able to stand out belongs to the people who are determined enough and sort of self-reliant enough mm. to pick up a camera and go and do something. But being with a director, if you're, if, you're, if you're a director and you've got a crew mm. and they're sort of being left to get the best sound and you, you, you can discuss what it is you want, it's very different to being stuck in that room with your contributor thinking, I need to shut the window, I yeah, need but the door, a, I need know, this. There's um, also, there's rough with the smooth. I mean, obviously... Every program has a, a, a very particular uh, sort of mandate in a way, and obviously working with larger crews, um, you have a very strict day, mm. um, and uh, you, know, you don't get a level of intimacy that mm. uh, you can get when you are self-shooting. Mm. Mm. Um, plus, obviously, you can work to your own schedule, mm. and you, know, you can make decisions on the hoof, and you don't have to communicate them out to a larger team. And that has its advantages so uh, you know I think that within you know within the palette that you choose if you have control over it I think there is value in having a crew so that you're freed up to think about the editorial if you like mm. and the management of your contributor uh, and also you know creating something that is visually arresting mm. uh, and then there's also the other position which is you know going it alone with your uh, in the wee small hours when you know your, your, your crews are kind of wrapped up in bed where you can you know, get to the get to the meat of the intimacy that you you want to create mm. uh, with your contributor. So I do think you can choose according. I don't think it's necessarily bad uh, that you know people self shoot. I think that what has happened though is that you've got 
uh, DPs or cameramen uh, that, that shot documentaries that, that are getting employed less and less and less because mm. self-shooting PDs, and I would argue that they are producer directors, they are gathering, you know, sometimes, mm. but they are gathering material in a way that um, cameramen would gather material mm -hmm. and then they get sent to this central dark place that you talk of mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, 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 and come out the other side as, as television that the broadcaster wants. Mm. So how you fight for your voice within that context mm. is, you know, shoot great material mm. and, uh, and have an awareness of the, of the end position, mm. but also try and convince some of those people you work with that actually, if we moved the camera around here, if we had this different lens, or if we had this piece of grip equipment, or if we had that light, or if we extended the schedule here, or if we had a, a little bit more of, you know, if we, if we got that composure instead of that, those are the sorts of little bits of edge mm. that you can start to employ mm. that actually improve the quality of the thing that you're trying to do. Mm. And it isn't simply just about that thing that's in front of the camera sometimes. Yes, because it's the logistics. I think years yeah. ago when we shot on tape, you could go off, you could have a really good shooting day, mm. and you've got your tapes, you can log them some other time. The idea now that you've got to come back to a hotel room if you're not back in London, and you're on a small team, you're well, not, you have a hotel you're not room. part of, well, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but you're not part of hospital where you've got a data wrangler. The idea you've got mm. to then sit and ingest. I mean, the, just the ways of working have changed. But that, that's completely normal for, for a director who's come up self-shooting. Yeah. See, they, of course different. they ingest, that's what you do. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So there, there isn't that, oh upload, my God, yeah. I'm, I'd yeah. rather have a beer than ingest. <laughs> you're, you're, talking, you're talking about it like it's a, a sort of a film school progression, in a way. That, 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 that level of like, okay, we start by cell shooting, managing raw yeah. material, and then, you know, yeah. uh, and then serving it up to the mm. big black hole. And then eventually mm. you move out of that space and, mm. and start to kind of control your medium when you've learnt but how do people get into that big black hole? Because I think this, the edit producing and now, um, yeah, edit directors that are coming. You know, th there's a there's a there's a world emerging that is that big black hole is becoming bigger. Yeah, I mean, there's there's also the, there's there's a level of creativity in designing the entire. You know, all those series, yeah. those big series that mm -hmm. use large teams. They're also you know the editorial yeah. side is very creatively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rich, led, but led. it's not. It's led by execs mm. and it's led by editors. It's not yes. led by shooting PDs. Mm -hmm. There's mm. still wiggle room for creativity, though, isn't there? I mean, I know within the team on prison, I had four shooting PDs. Yes, there had to be a consistent look, mm. but within that, there was a lot of wiggle room to be creative. And there's never, you know, there's no such thing as a bad idea. Um, so, for instance, if um, we had a look for interviews, we had a look for shooting an admission and a liberation. But within that, there was a lot of wiggle room. So if we were shooting actuality, it was really up to the PD in that moment where they were shooting that actuality, what the content was, what questions they're asking. Mm -hmm. There's certainly a lot of creativity in that. The directors, while they were all shooting on C300s, could choose whether they were shooting on primes or zooms. So there was, again, mm -hmm. their individuality wasn't stifled in that mm -hmm. way either. And there was a way of telling a story um, I called it in the edit conscious wallpaper. Um, so basically it's when a, 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 the prisoner may not be saying very much at that time, but what can convey their emotion more is a cutaway, a shot, a beautiful shot through the bars, pulling focus with the clouds going over and the trees, whatever it might be, or even mm. a dripping tap. They're using therefore their creativity mm. to communicate the emotion of that prisoner in that moment. And it's also an incredibly cerebral thing. Mm. And uh, I was, you know, we had some really rich rushes as a result of giving, saying, yes, okay, I need this. Mm -hmm. But please, you know, knock yourself out. Go and do as much as you can mm -hmm. to bring your skills to the fore. Mm -hmm. So team vision then, is it disempowering or is it empowering for directors? Do they stand out of the crowd within a team, Dan? Well, I think, you know, to, to stand out, you have, a, you have to have a bit of a bad attitude, probably. <laughs> yeah. um, um, I certainly had one when, at the beginning of my career and probably still have one now, but I've, it's been tempered by, you know, the necessity to work. I mean, ultimately, we have an amazing television industry here, an amazing factual TV industry. There's a lot of people who really only want the best and who, who are inspired by documentaries that we all love. And, and so it's not like, you know, we're in this sort of grinding, you know, commercial machine. The public service television here is fantastic. And so I think you have to temper your bad attitude with a, with a which is necessary to, in order to get ultimately get a little bit of your vision 
I always say directors have to have an ego the size of a house because by the time you've been through the edit and <laughs> had the life crushed out of you, it's going to be sort the size of, of a pea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have to start out with a jolly big ego and, 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 and a really bad attitude, and by the end, you're a really nice kind of pea-sized thing. So, <laughs> but, I mean, that's part of the process, and you mustn't be afraid to assert what you want and then also to listen. It's key. It's not, you know, it's not a good idea to just blindly go for the, the bits you like about what you shot. Because it, you know, ultimately the story, the collective, the story, the assembly, the the, the bigger picture will always was that the end. It so will always stuff, always it's takes normal. priority over over the individual bits that you like. That amazing scene you shot, or that beautiful thing you did, you're going to fight for, and you get really upset when when it gets kicked out. But ultimately, you know, you have to acknowledge that the whole is more important than the than the part. So to sum up then, because it's, it's getting near question time, um, so for you, Dan, being a badass director, is how are you going to stand out? I said having a bad attitude, not being a badass director. Right, um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think you do, you know, um, standing out, yeah, you do have to be a little bit troublesome because otherwise you won't make a mark. Okay. Yeah. And Amanda, how do you stand out from the crowd? Oh, that's a bit on the... Um, I think you can. You, I think you can learn a bit. Of, you can learn a bit of the craft, certainly in these bigger, these bigger, these bigger teams. But it's just like your pitching thing with Channel Four. It's good execs, um, and it's finding those teams. Um, and uh, yeah, you see, my love is the is the intimacy of the smaller, smaller scale projects, and it's whether there's going to be more of those commissioning, being commissioned. Um, Absolutely. And Bruce. Um, I think it's about sometimes choice of subject um, and where you position the camera to a large degree. Um, and increasingly, I'm sort of you know positioning it on the side of the uh, of the badass as opposed to the, uh, the victim. And uh, 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 and and then there with that, there's a um, always a need to try and make something. Um, and I hate to use the word original, but it's because it never is. You're, you're sort of always you know. I try and work the material quite a lot and work the idea a lot, you know, and, 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 and use the team around me to kind of, I always say that I have my best ideas with other people, never in isolation. So to think that directing is an isolating, uh, um, uh, you know, job, it, it, it really it's isn't. It's not, it's, it, we all say it's, you know, it, I mean, there is a team thing, but you are, you have to drive that team. You have to have a very clear vision and you have to be able to share that very clear vision. And I think sometimes directors have an inability to share that clear vision. And I think that they, they step away from it thinking, no, no, I have to keep it like this. No, you've got to share it. Yeah, I think that, yeah. that, that, that's key. You have yeah. to, it, it, it's weird because it's a balance between um, knowing, kind of knowing what you want, but also going, what do you think? And listening to the reply and consider, you know, being, if, if your ego is like bad ego, where you're like me, 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 and I don't want to listen to anyone else, and it's all got to make, everything, everything that happens has to make me look good right now. What you've got to remember is you, you need to look good at the end. You need to look good. It's all about looking good because your program but is, is it fucking not about amazing. You? It's about storytelling, and it's doing justice to the story, isn't it? Yeah, but I mean, directors, yeah. you know. No, it's all about me. It's all about me. <laughs> it's all about me. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, on that note, uh, I'd like to open it up to the floor for questions. So if anybody's brave enough, I will just try and, yes, lady at the front here in a black T-shirt in the middle. Hi, um, this is lesson, uh, a question for Bruce. Hi. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that you started off producing a documentary and then due to whatever happened, you felt that you needed to turn it into a drama. Can you just explain a bit more what you mean by that? Like, did you change the, the, the characters into, you changed them to actors or? I think um, sometimes, I mean, it, it kind of started where Sometimes as a director, I mean, I, 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 I forever, you know, there's a, there's a massive curiosity when you're, when you're filming, and, and sometimes you can't quite get, um, I think I said that, uh, you know, your job as director is trying to bring the viewer as close to your material as, as you possibly can, or close to the story you're trying to tell. Um, and sometimes I found I, that, that the, by simply making work in, in a documentary form wasn't reaching the places that I wanted to, want, I personally wanted it to reach. And so I started using reconstruction in some way. And then, um, and then I found that some of the stories um, that I wanted to tell, you couldn't tell as documentary because they involved children, for instance, uh, who had been you know, trafficked or were asylum seekers. So using drama started to kind of 
allow me to um, express a life as it happened, because sometimes you can't be in those places as they happen. And so therefore, reconstructing them and trying to bring an audience as close as you possibly can, using, using as many techniques as you possibly can, was always, and still always, is my, you know, the, uh, uh, foremost in my mind. And I haven't at all moved away from documentary. I think, uh, you know, documentary informs pretty much everything I do, whether it's, you know, something as, uh, as broad as Born to Kill, or, uh, you know, or as, as pure as, as, um, as our war. I mean, I'm, I'm currently making a document, documentary now, and the biggest question is, how do I make someone who is very, very challenging as a person, very negative person, um, uh, over three hours, how do I make them, uh, how do I make an audience identify with this man who is a scumbag? You know, it's quite, it's, it's, it's a hard job. Uh, and, uh, you know, but he may not have been a killer, you know. So it's kind of sort of like, it's always asking myself that question and then figuring out where the answer is and then trying to persuade whoever's giving me the money that this might be the best route to go because obviously the drama route is always the most expensive. Did that answer your question? It did, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So lady, right at the front here in the white T-shirt. So the lights are quite bright, so my... Yeah, we can't see a thing. can't see, so I will work my way back. Oh. Hi. Um, it's a great panel. Um, I'm a director. I'm Hannah, and I notice I shoot as well, and actually Dan's given me lots of help when I <laughs> changed camera and went up onto the primes and stuff. And I just noticed a thing that it seems to be, some of the women I notice are intimidated by the idea of shooting, and they're gonna rule themselves out of being the directors because they're not shooting. And I think that's wrong, and so, I want yeah. to encourage women directors. And I know it's a weird question, but I just wanna know what you all think about that element, because even though there's lots of men that might be more techie than me, it's not all about that. Of course, a lot of it's framing. Once you're, you know, so I feel like I bring maybe a different sensibility sometimes to shooting than some of the male directors who might know a lot more about the camera we use do. Um, but anyway, it's a bit of an odd question. But do you think there's stuff that can be done to make sure that it's women and men in the era of everyone? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to answer that because I, I think there's absolutely no barrier to women. I mean, there's nothing that you need to do when you operate a camera that is more difficult for a woman to do than for a man, apart from perhaps if you want to sort of be a human steady cam or, or whatever, you know, there's the weight of the camera, the weight of the equipment, you can design your, your kit around that, you can adapt the way you shoot, there are devices that you can use like the Easy Rig, et cetera, et cetera. So there is absolutely no obstacle uh, to a, a woman wanting to be a shooting, an excellent shooting PD, and there are women who shoot brilliantly. So I think it's a, it's a sort of cultural stereotype that blokes are sort of better at techie camera things. That's a complete, that's complete bollocks, and um, it should, you shouldn't give it a second thought if you're a woman wanting to, wanting to shoot. And certainly if you came to me, I wouldn't, I mean, I just, you know, I'm, I'm always asking female PDs, why don't you shoot, actually? Um, because it's just not difficult. You just need to, you know, and I, we can help people do that. But uh, I'd really encourage women to, to get out there and, ha and have the confidence to do it because there's really nothing stopping them. I agree, because if you have a good eye, you'll be able to shoot. That's yeah. what I always say to them, just stop thinking about all the other bits and because I think a lot of women are intimidated out of it and I think it's a cultural thing to do with what men are seen as good at and, and women in TV sometimes. Yeah, I think the more, you know, the more female PDs we see out there like hefting a camera and having their picture taken with it and, and you know, <laughs> that getting around on social media and, and the image of the, the self-shooter not always being a bloke. I need to change my Twitter picture. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Get the biggest camera you can. <laughs> so somebody from the near the back. Oh, there's a lady then, Salmon. Salmon. Um, just a question for uh, Amanda, actually. When, when you're talking about um, the okay. degree of intimacy that you managed to get, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> and when you're talking about the, the degree of intimacy that you managed to get with the people in the hospital and, you know, consultants and mm. nurses and, uh, you know, busy uh, sort of critical life-saving environments, how did you, you need them to, um, to prioritise, you know, you wanting that level of intimacy, if you like? How did you, you know, how do you do that? How do you manage to get them complicit in what, you know, to, to take time out of their, uh, you know, out of their, whilst they're engaged in such <coughs> critical work to talk so, to you? I, I think it was all the work that was done by the team ahead of us, because uh, Rain Charka Phillips, the, one of the execs, has talked about the fact that it was a year, a year in securing the access, 
And Tom Curry, one of the series producers, spent a lot of time in the hospital showing the taster tape everywhere across so many sites. We as PDs saw the taster tape, so tonally understood what it was. And all the people that I met with, or I mean, I, I sort of was planted into intensive care as my, my first area. So there were some key people there who said, not interested, not remotely interested. But I still wanted them, if they were willing to, to see the taster tapes, so they understood what, you know, to set out the stool, really, and to say, to give a sense of what it was we were trying to do. Because uh, these are people who will be comparing it to other, document other documentaries they'd have seen. And at least the taster tape gave a, sen gave a sense of how this was going to be done differently. Um, and so ultimately, all you can do is to inform people and I think I've generally always found that in certainly institutions, there's all, there will always be people who don't want to take part. But when they start to see the way of working, those people sometimes do start to come on board. I mean, I don't think I'd want to take part in a documentary. Yeah. But you, you, you know, do, do you want someone coming back watching you put your makeup on or cook in the kitchen or do the ironing? It's all of those moments that we like to yeah. chat to people. So I think if people see the way of working, that, that's... One, one good way of starting to make it work. Though, I mean, Johnny's here who worked on it as well. The truth is there were key people who didn't want to take part at all, yeah. who were crucial in, say, an A&E set up. And if that particular person was there and it was their shift, those people working in that area knew that actually there was only a certain amount of material that could be shot on that day. So you just, you turn yourself into, a, you know, you, 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 you divert. So you just can't assume. But it's personal. Ultimately, it's them trusting you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Hi. So my question is about this divide between the shooting PDs and the black hole of the edit. And you've talked about how directors can stand out in the type of material that they're delivering. But I was wondering about your duty of care to your contributors and your duty of care to the truth if you're not in the edit to sort of see how your story is shaped because, you know, I've often worked with an editor who will sort of put something together and I'm not in the room and then I'll come in and say, well, we can't do that because that's not how it was or that's not really what they're trying to say there. And I think only if you're the person there directing and then you're the person in the edit, you're the only person who, who has the truth of that story. Can I just, uh, do you, are you involved in, in that sort of production yourself? No, I mostly work on kind of presenter-led history and art stuff, but I mean, I'm it's interested a, it's, in this. It's very, very, very... I mean, yeah, you should probably like no, because yeah. that, that's exactly how I felt, because yeah. I was coming at it as a shooting PD with a complete track, re you know, track, uh, track record and history of making single films. And so I felt very uncomfortable at the beginning of shooting material that sort of just got spilt into this big pool, yeah. um, which is probably partly why I... You know, wanted to do this log of feeling, what had I shot, what, what have people told me? And I, and, I, and I can't deny that I found it extremely difficult, this idea that there was this extra eye on my shoulder. So normally you shoot your material, you go into an edit, and you have your editor on side, only the sort of that small group and the exec are seeing the material. It felt extremely public um, that... You know, the last you have in an edit and you're looking at your own material because you shot it and you know the mistakes that were made because the lights weren't on or things that go wrong. Um, but also, to the truth of what happened, when you watched the films that came out of the material that you produced, yeah. were, they, were they the story that you thought that you were filming? And did they, were they a true reflection? They were. They were for well, hospitals. That's but, good to it, know. And again, it's, but, it, but then you see it's a, it, it was... It, it was it was the way in which it was put together. And, um, you know, I, I, as I say, I was in intensive care, so I was following those stories. But, and it's also the relationships we had with the rest of the team. So uh, it, it, you don't shoot in isolation. You're part of those six shooting PDs and, and having a very close relationship with the, with the series producers. And is there a dialogue with the edit as the edit's happening? Or not? Uh, no, not for us, not for us. I mean, I did say actually to Lorraine today, talking about it with series two, the thing that I really benefited from, benefited from and we could have done more of is finding the time in the schedule and there never is I suppose was to look at other people's materials and stories to be a bit more part of that creative process of how you know I don't use an e easy rig but there were a few people who were using easy rigs and their problem was this mine is is that you know I mean in the edit it must have been really irritating with 
stuff going that way and stuff going, me getting that, my monopod cork between my legs, all, all those things. So you want to help them see how they're going to knit these things together. But I do think that that black hole is a huge thing that will come up as a discussion and, and how you, how there is an apprenticeship of moving directors into an edit. It, it's, so, it's so important. If I could add to that, um, on the prison series, we had uh, four shooting producer directors in four different prisons, uh, two male, two female, by the way. Um, and we had weekly meetings. Uh, we had the, the guys were going to prisons four days a week. And on Fridays, everybody would gather, uh, partly to let off steam, counselling, everybody kind of talking to everybody else. Uh, it, was, it was a really important day for us. We had a group meeting where we'd be showing rough cuts, and I always had my directors view the rough cuts because none of the shooting PDs were in the edit on prisons for scheduling reasons. And because the period of time in prisons was so long, they were in prison for three months per team. Um, but everybody saw early cuts. Uh, the most important thing, it was my duty really as CU's producer on it to make sure that they were authentic and that we were being true to the contributors. Thanks. Okay, anybody at the back? Anybody? No, here, yes, please. Um, so a question for all of you, it's a bit loaded, but as a director, what is the worst piece of advice you've ever received? <laughs> I've got one. Go. <laughs> Shoot the shit out of everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. I hate that. I always like to make sure that anything and everything is quality. Sense of purpose, why you're there, yeah. People always get obsessed by uh, exteriors of houses and stuff. I, uh, <laughs> I'm not very good at that. Gu guilty buildings. <laughs> I think there were, um, I think sometimes we've got to look out for, I remember being, um, during, the, during the war in Kosovo, I was out and, and filming the war and for, for Channel 4, for a film called The Valley. And there was a point where I, I wasn't, the access was falling apart and, you know, you're having a dreadful time and it's dangerous and all sorts of things could really go very badly wrong. And so you're thinking, oh, what do I do? And I remember being on the phone to my exec at the time and he said, well, you know, maybe go and just shoot some interviews with, like, refugees and stuff like that. And, um, and at the time I remember thinking, yeah, but oh, that's, not what, that's not a film I want to make. And, um, and so you're, you're between a rock and a hard place because you're, you're someone suggesting that you do something that's creatively unfulfilling, but on the other hand, the really creatively ambitious, brilliant thing that you want to do is not actually available to you that day and filming days are ticking by and, and, and uh, the situation's going to shit and all that. So I think, I think beware of people who offer you easy solutions, execs, who go, well, never mind, just sort of get this and it'll be okay. Um, it's tempting as an exec to do that because you want to solve a problem. Someone's in difficulty and you want to give them an option that they can actually achieve that day with the resources they've got. But sometimes you've just got to sort of linger a bit longer on the edge of the cliff and, um, and, and you know, usually there's, there is a ladder down to where you want to go. I think okay. you're right. It is, it is, it is advice. It's execs for the good and the bad yeah. because when they say, go shoot the funeral, and you say, oh, no, the funeral, <laughs> that's, you know... Um, yeah. But, but because it's a relationship, you explain the reasons why, and, and that's why everyone should be happy. Let's uh, finish on a happy note. Um, thanks to our speakers. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you.